Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to be in the house of the Lord today, to be here with you all to worship this morning and to uh, to seek God's face and to find what it is that he has for us. Amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 13, that's where we're going to begin today, I think, that's where we're going to begin. I'm really just trying to listen to God and discern the message that he would have for us today. It's kind of one of those days where I've come and I have three or four different sermons I'm still trying to figure out which one it is that God has for us today. Um, Let's just go to God in prayer this morning. Oh, Father God, we just love you this morning, and we thank you for your sweet presence that is here today. We thank you for your love that you have poured out upon us, and we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that you know the words that we need to hear today, the words that will move us closer to you, the words that will move us closer to the, your perfect will for our lives. And God, we just ask this morning that you reveal that word to us today. God, this morning, Lord, I just ask that you use me as your vessel. Lord, I humble myself before you. And Father, I just declare in front of this congregation today that, Lord, I do not want to speak the words of myself, but I want to only speak the words that you would have for us to hear today. Father, I pray this morning that that the gospel that is alive and sharper than any double-edged sword, Father, will move amongst us today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Father, may we have open hearts to receive the word that you have. not be afraid to allow it to move within us. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to begin in Matthew chapter uh, 13. In verse 44, Matthew 13, verse Matthew 13, 44. And we're going to read um, three parables here that Jesus spoke to the people. Beginning in verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. The other night, my wife and I had the opportunity of sitting in a prayer chapel at Camp Nifley, the Emmaus campground, 
for a particular time. And during that time, the Lord led me to this passage of Scripture, a passage of Scripture that I've heard preached many times, a passage of Scripture I've heard taught many times, a passage of Scripture that I have preached and taught myself concerning these three parables. But that night as I sat at that desk, reading the Word of God and seeking His face, He pointed out a big difference here to me that I had never seen before. And maybe you've seen this before. Maybe you've never paid no, maybe you've never paid no attention to it. Maybe you have. And so this morning I'll be thinking, yeah, Brother Troy already knew this. Why aren't you preaching it? Well, I want you to know I'm preaching it because I need to hear it, okay? I need to hear this today. Because you know what? Whenever I preach, it's not always just for the people out there. Nine out of ten times, it's for me too. Actually, ten out of ten times, because I can usually get something out of it, right? So anyways, so I want to begin by comparing verses 44 with the parable that we find in verses 45 and 46. And I'm going to need a little uh, community participation, okay? So I need y'all to answer some questions for me as I go along. Is that okay? Y'all know how I roll. Okay, so here we go. So in verse 44, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like what? Treasure. A hidden treasure. And who finds that treasure? Man does. And when man finds that treasure, what does he do? He hid it. But he has joy first because he had found the kingdom of heaven, he found this treasure, then he hides it, and then he does what? But what does he do before he buys it? He sells what? All. He sells everything. He sold everything that he had, and he goes, but notice he doesn't purchase the treasure. What does he purchase? The field that contained the treasure. And it is his. So we have heaven is like a treasure that is hidden, and it brought joy to the man, and he sold all that he had, and he went and he found it. Okay? Then we come to verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a what? A merchant man what? Seeking. In verse 44, do you notice that the kingdom of heaven is is being sought but in verses 45 and 46 the kingdom of heaven is doing the seeking do you see that difference in verse 44 the kingdom of heaven is being sought by man but in verse 45 we read that the kingdom of heaven is seeking the pearl and it says when they found one beautiful pearl what does the merchant do sells everything and does what and bought it okay is everybody with me so far do you see the difference there do you see the difference between the man searching for the kingdom of heaven and then for the kingdom of heaven searching for man okay so let's back up and talk about us Searching for the kingdom of heaven. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Look at that. Turn to Romans 14, 17. This is a good verse to know. It's a good one to have highlighted. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Now, my people at Great Oaks would have a problem with that. Because every time we get together, we eat. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We used to have breakfast on Sunday morning. We'd have a snack on Sunday night. We'd have supper on Wednesday night. If we had anything in between, we always had food. So they always thought the kingdom of heaven had to deal with food, right? Of course, it says in Acts that they got together every day and they broke bread together, they fellowshiped together, they ate together. But if we're not careful, we can get off focus and think heaven 
the kingdom of God and church is all about the fellowship, but there is more to it than just the fellowship. He says that it is about righteousness. What is righteousness? Right standing with God. And we are in right standing with God only because of the price that Jesus paid for us. It is about peace. I had a dream this morning. I don't know what all was happening, but this person came to me and they said, Troy, the peace of God comes in three ways or from three different things. And, and I'm still trying to unwrap this in my mind. It said, God, Holy Spirit, and repentance. And I'm still trying to unwrap that. Maybe that's going to be my next message. I don't know that God wants me to, to declare. But the peace of God that passes all understanding. I don't know about you, but I'm in a season right now in my life that I'm not really for sure what's next. But I know God's got it. And I can't worry. And then Jesus said that he was leaving so that a comforter could come to us, and that comforter is Holy Spirit, and he would bring us peace. And then he was telling me in that dream that some of us might need to be in a place of repentance because of the uneasiness in our life could really be taken care of if we would repent that sin unto the Lord. Because you know when you have unconfessed sin in your life, it causes a churning. It causes a, a disturbance in your life. The other day I was at a service and it was time for communion and the Lord told me to go and apologize to two people. The room is packed full of people. But I knew if I did not go and ask forgiveness from those two people, that there would still be this uneasiness in me. And I want you to know, when I went, and I'm just bragging on God, I'm not bragging on Troy, but when I went and looked at those two people in the eyes, and I said, I apologize for not being there when I needed to be there in your life. And I ask that you forgive me. I want you to know immediately this uneasiness that had been in me was done away with, and I felt the peace of God like I have not felt in so long. And when I took communion that morning or that afternoon, oh gosh, it was such a good time with the Lord. So the kingdom of heaven, when we come to Romans, the kingdom of God is not of eating and drinking, but it's of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. I don't know about you, but when I found the kingdom of heaven in my life, I was filled with joy. I was filled with joy because I experienced a taste of something I had never had before in my life. I have felt freedom from the past. I have felt freedom from what it was that was holding me down. And I want you to know that throughout my journey, there have been chapters in my life where I have experienced that joy and that peace of heaven over and over and over because there is more to explore in the kingdom of God than just a one-day event. There is a continuous exploring of the kingdom of heaven and finding out what it is that God has for every one of us. Now, being raised in the Methodist church and attending a Methodist seminary, we learned a lot about John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist church. And he talked about there were three graces, provenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Provenient grace is that grace that grandma, that Sunday school teacher, always praying for you and for you to come to the Lord. The justifying grace is that moment that you accept Jesus and you cross that threshold into the kingdom of heaven but sanctifying grace is that grace that carries us from the cross on through the rest of our life. You know, the church, I've heard me say this before, the church has been so good of getting people to the cross. But there's a whole other life on the other side of the cross. And how are we going to live on the other side of the cross? And so the sanctifying grace of God is what takes us from place to place to place. And John Wesley likened it to going into a mansion 
And he says, sanctifying grace would take you from room to room to room to room to room. And you would understand more of the kingdom of God and you would find more of the kingdom of God. And I want you to know in my life that there have been journeys where I have found more of the kingdom of God. And every time it was like that layer was just peeled back. You ever watch the movie Shrek? What does Shrek say? He's like an onion. It has to be peeled layer by layer by layer to get to that sweet core. Well, my life is kind of like that. All of us are like that. We have layers, right? And every time we have an encounter with God and we allow him, he pulls those layers back and we experience more of the kingdom of God. We experience more of his joy. We experience more of his peace. And I want that in my life. But in order for that to happen, the man went and sold all that he had. Now, there have been times in my life where I felt like God said, Troy, sell everything you have. Literally. He asked me one day, he said, Troy, would you sell your house? And I said, yes, I would sell my house. And the very next day, a lady showed up on our porch and said, can I buy your house? And Troy said, I should have said yes, but Troy said, let me pray about that. You ever know that you ever have those moments where you're like, I'm going to say yes, I'm going to say it. No, I didn't say yes. Sorry. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I gave that good Christian answer in the middle. I'll pray about it. Oh, gosh, I felt so bad. And we left the very next day going to Pensacola and went to Pensacola, Florida, and went to a tent revival. And the gentleman's preaching there. He preached about the rich young ruler who wanted to inherit the kingdom. And Jesus said, well, sell all that you got. And what did the guy do? He left sad. So instead of the young rich ruler, he was a sad poor servant because he was really a servant to what he owned instead of becoming a part of the kingdom of God. And so I just, I heard God asked me that question, and I was like, God, forgive me that I didn't say yes. So I went back to my room that night at the hotel, and I emailed the lady, and I said, I am so sorry that I didn't say yes. We will sell you our house. I didn't hear from her for three months. And she came to me, and she said, I am sorry that I didn't get back with you. She said, but I just stopped at your house on a whim. You see, I don't think the lady's intention was ever to buy my house. And I don't think it was ever God's intention for me to sell my house. But what God was wanting to know was I willing to give all that I had to follow him. Remember the story of Abraham and Isaac when God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? He doesn't tell Isaac what's going on, but he takes Isaac and his servants and he says, let's go. And so they get to the bottom of the mountain where Abraham knows he has to go up to sacrifice his son. And Abraham says, we will go, we will worship, and we will come back. He didn't say, we will go, we will worship, and I will come back. But he said, we will come back because he knew somehow God was going to work it out to where he could keep his son. But he had to be willing to lay it all down. What I'm learning more in my life is this. To sell it all means, it might be literally selling everything you got. But in my life, this is what it's meant lately is, God, I am willing to lay every bit of my plans down. All of my plans, I'm laying them down. And God, I want your plans to be my plans. And when you truly do that, there is such peace that comes over you that you can hold your head high and you can go through life, not knowing what tomorrow holds, but knowing he's got it. Amen? Amen. So I go back to that story of the parables as Jesus is telling in Matthew. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. <coughs> seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I want to pause there for a minute and talk about the parable of the sheep. 
Remember the story of the 99 and the 1? Jesus did what? He left the 99 to go after the 1. The shepherd left the 99 to go after the 1. As I was reading this parable the other night in that prayer chapel there at Camp Nifley, I began thinking about the story of Jesus, or we say Jesus, leaving the 99, going after the 1. And we can say Jesus died for the whole world, but you can break that down and say Jesus died for me. He died for you, Christian. He died for you, Randy. He died for you, Tanya. He died for you, Stephanie. Yes, he died for the entire world, but there is a personal level there where he died for me. If I was the only human on the face of the earth, I believe... Jesus would have gave his life for me. But you read in Isaiah that Jesus came to give his life so that we could go to the Father because the only things that are allowed in the presence of the Father are those which are righteous and holy. And we said well ago that righteousness is given to us through Christ. It's not anything we earn. It's not anything we can do. But it is what Christ has done for us so that we can be with the Father. Because He desires to be with us. So when I read this, and it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, and he founds one and he gives it all. You know what that all is? It's Jesus. God gave His Son. He gave His all. I want you to know right now, my house, my vehicles, which aren't worth much, our poor van is tore up by the raccoons. I don't know if you've hit a raccoon, but it's tore out the whole front end of our van. It's got 280,000 miles on it. won't get much money for it. Driving an 84 Dodge truck, not going to get much for that either. Got a Ford Expedition with three busted bark heads in it and heads. I mean, you know, I don't get much money for what I have, okay? Just be honest with you. Lawnmower, the deck's off sitting on the front porch. Lawnmower's in the garage. Got some buys, so they won't bring much. But I want you to know, my sons and my daughters are worth more to me than anything in this world. They are precious to me. But if my love for them is so great, the Word tells us that God's love for us is even greater. I, can only, I can't even get imagine what the love of God was for His Son, but He was yet willing to give Him so that he could buy me. He could buy you. So when I read the kingdom of heaven, it's like a merchant seeking. This is what excited me the other day. Not only am I seeking the kingdom of heaven and all that's in it, but God is seeking me. Jesus is seeking me. Holy Spirit is seeking me. The kingdom of heaven is seeking you. And he is waiting for us to say yes. Because I can seek Stephanie all that I want to. And I can go after Stephanie and say, come on, Stephanie, let's go. We got to do work. We got to do work. Come on, come on, come on. But until she is willing to say yes, I will go. There's going to be a break there. There's going to be that break. It excites me to know that there is a God who loves me so much. He has his whole kingdom on the search for me. He has his whole kingdom on and search for you in the fullness that you were created to be. But he is just waiting for us to say, yes, I will go. I will be part of your kingdom. I will do what it is that you want me to do.
I was doing a lot of reading this morning, trying to say, Lord, what is it you want us to hear? It's kind of like there's three different messages that just keep trying to come together. And in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, I came across this verse this morning as Rich was teaching in Sunday school, and I wanted to shout, but I figured it might take away from your message, brother. So, do what? No, I wouldn't mind at all, brother. I wouldn't mind. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The kingdom that is seeking you and me, the God who is seeking you and me, will crush Satan under our feet shortly. I love that verse. I love that verse because the kingdom that's coming after me and you, he already knows what we're going through. He already knows what the enemy's doing. And he says that he will crush him under our feet shortly. Praise God. This morning they were talking about in adult Sunday school about Adam and Eve in the garden. And, you know, Eve and Adam took of the fruit and their eyes were open to their nakedness. And then God pours out the punishment. He delivers the punishment. And part of the punishment was that the enemy would be where? Under the feet of Satan. I mean, under the feet of Jesus. That Satan would bruise the heel, but the heel of Jesus would do what? Crush his head. You ever seen the Passion of Christ? You know that, that scene in the Passion of Christ where the snake comes along and it reaches up and bites and then the heel of Jesus crushes its head? Think about that. Jesus has already promised that he is going to crush the head of Satan under our feet. I have been in a place in the last couple of years where I have allowed the enemy to bite my ankles. You ever had the enemy bite your ankles? You know what I'm talking about? Just constantly. (laughs) And instead of doing something and getting rid of it, I just allowed it to keep happening. Instead of standing on the word that says the kingdom of God that seeks after me, he has promised me that he is going to crush this head under my feet. There's a song we used to sing. um, Well, I went back to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Gosh, we need to sing that every day. We need to sing that every day. The days that we wake up and we're already bad, like, I don't know how today's going to happen. God, I'm worried about this. God, I'm worried about this. Is this going to take place? Say no to fear and doubt and say, I am crushing the head of Satan today. And I am not going to let that bother me. I wrote in my Bible beside that verse 20, God will do it. The God of peace will crush Satan under our feet shortly. Praise God. Praise God. Now go back to Matthew 13. He says the kingdom of heaven, in verse 47, is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good in the vessels but threw the bad away. There have been several times in my ministry where I've been praying about, God, how do you want us to grow our ministry? I'm not about numbers, but we want to see people in our church, don't we? I mean, we want to see people here. We want people to come and and be a part of our family and grow. And I was like, God, how do you want us to do that? I mean, there are so many churches that are so good at at, uh, PR. They know how to sell their stuff. You know what I'm saying? They got the right person that can develop the right web page. They got the right person that can develop all these nifty postcards. I mean, I've always wanted to develop those nifty postcards. All I can afford and do is like take a piece of paper and write something on it and send it out. Maybe print it out. People that make awesome commercials. People that have access to all this. Well, guess what? I don't have that. And I'm like, God, come on. 
my wife keeps telling me, get business cards. Get business cards, Troy, and pass them out, pass them out, pass them out. I thought about sending letters out. Hey, I can come to your church and do this, and come to your church and do that, and come to your church and do this. And every time I've gone to do it, I've heard God say, stop. Let me do this. I was reading this about the dragnet, and I thought of the book of Acts. Day of Pentecost. 120 gathered in the upper room, worshiping and praising. And the Spirit of God falls. And thousands of people were saved that day. Do you know what they were saved by? The sound. That came out of that room. The sound that came out of their worship brought 3,000 people into the kingdom of God that day. It was like God sent out a dragnet and pulled them all in. You see, the kingdom of God, if it's searching, it's going to throw out the net and it's going to pull them in. But our part is to be obedient to God and continue to keep our face on Him and worshiping Him and seeking Him and seeking more of His kingdom and he's going to take care of the rest. See what I'm saying? He might lead us to do a radio spot. He might lead us to put something in the newspaper. He might lead us to put something on Facebook. But you better not do it unless God says, Hey, Shelly, put this on Facebook today. Hey, Bubby, call the big dog and see if you can go and talk. Because God's got a plan. He knows how his dragnet works. He knows how his dragnet for C4 Church works, and he's waiting for people who are seeking his kingdom in his face, and then he's going to be seeking those who need to come and be a part of as well. So what is our role in being obedient to him? Psalm 4610 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Church, I want to encourage you today. To know that God is God. And He's got a plan. He's got a plan. You seek him, and you seek his kingdom, and you seek his joy and his peace. And I want you to watch God work the rest of it out. In those days in your life where you feel like you just can't take another step, plant your feet and say, God, I love you, and I am seeking your face today. Not seeking the solution to the answer, but seeking to the one who give the answers. That's the problem. We seek the answer more than we seek the one who gives the answer. What's that song talks about? It's an old song. We seek the healing more than we seek the healer. Then our healing becomes an idol. Our answers can become an idol when we're seeking it more than we're seeking the face of God. And I want you to know there's been a lot of times in my life where I've sought more of the answer than I sought more of God. And that's usually when I become God and try to make things happen. You know what I'm talking about? And I make a big mess, Shelly. You're exactly right. And there's a lot more repentance that has to take place and a lot more asking forgiveness and a lot more, hun sorry, honey, I should have listened to you. I've learned that about my wife. I just say sorry a lot. It's okay. And you know what gets in the way a lot of times? It's our stubbornness. See, my hair wrestle with stubbornness. Rich is like, no. You know, I got to tell you all this story. So the other day, two weekends ago, Dassey, our three-year-old Dassey, was on the porch, Stephanie was on the porch, some of our friends were there who go to church with us, and Jonathan's had a really bad ingrown toenail, and um, 
Dassey did something to it. I don't know what she did. I wasn't even there. And it caused him some pain. Well, Stephanie tried to get Dassey to apologize because we try to teach our kids, even if it's an accident, you still must apologize. She wouldn't. Would not say, I'm sorry. Stephanie takes her in the house, busts her hind in twice, and puts her to bed. She's like, we're done with this. So the next morning, Dassey gets up, and Stephanie starts this conversation with her. Hadassah, when we get to church today, you're going to have to apologize to Jonathan. Nope, I am not. That's right, buddy. So Stephanie gets to church. She's like, let's apologize. Still would not apologize. So I'm in my office trying to get ready for church. Stephanie brings Dassey into the office and sets her down in a chair in front of my desk, and she said, you talk to her. She will not listen to me. And so uh, I talked with Dassey, and I'm like, Dassey, you're going to have to apologize to John John. No, I am not. I mean, this is a three-year-old, three-year-old. So I told her she loves to get on the stage and uh, lead worship with Sarah Kate, her other daughter. And um, there was communion that morning. And I told her, I said, Hadassah, I said, you cannot lead worship this morning. And you cannot take communion until you ask Jonathan to forgive you. I said, we cannot do that with a black spot in our heart. Okay, I'll apologize. So we go out to the sanctuary. Jonathan's sitting out there. We take her up to Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, Dassey wants to tell you something. She would not say it. She's like, nope, me not do it. I took her outside, busted her six times on the hind end, brought her inside. Please don't turn me in. But anyways, came in, still would not say I'm sorry. So we go back to my office. We sit there. The church starts. We come out. I'm like the jail warden. You know, warden, you know, I got her by the hand, and she's following me. We don't talk to anybody. We don't look at anybody. People's trying to talk to her. I said, sorry, she's not talking today. And we went and sat down. Again with church. She sat with Stephanie after a little bit, my wife. And then I got up to preach, and I noticed Stephanie gets up and takes her to the kitchen. I thought, oh, this is not good. So she's got a smile on her face. I said, well, maybe this is good. So I find out the rest of the story. Stephanie said they're sitting there, and Dassey's like, I'm hungry. And Stephanie said, you can't eat until you apologize. She says, but I'm hungry. She said, you're not going to eat until you apologize. So she buried her head and Stephanie's shoulders. She's like, Ooh. I guess she was trying to ask forgiveness in tongues. I don't know what she was doing. <laughs> Stephanie said, what did you say? And so finally she reached up and looked at Jonathan and said, I'm sorry. Stephanie takes her to the kitchen to get her some food. And that's when I saw him get up. And Stephanie said they walked through the door and Dassey put her hands on her hip. And she said, wow, Mommy, that sure was easy. Yeah, stubborn. And I can laugh at that story, but you know what? There's many times in my life where I've been like that with God. God has said, hey, this isn't right. You need to take care of this. And I refused. When really, if we just come to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. I've made a mess of this. I need your help. He cleans it up. And what got Dassey to the point of saying, I'm sorry, is she was hungry. And if you're hungry enough for more of God and his kingdom, you'll get to that place where you'll be on your face before God and you'll say, God, I'm sorry. Are you hungry for more of that kingdom? Because I want you to know he's hungry for you. And he's done sent his son. He's done paid the price for you. A beautiful pearl. He's just waiting for us to say yes. You might say, Brother Troy, I'm a believer. Praise God you're a believer. But there is more that God has for you. There is more. He wants to take you deeper. He wants to give you more. He wants to unleash more of his power in your life. But he is waiting for you to say yes. I'll ask the praise team if they'll come this morning. Can we do um, 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 more Siki? Brother Cameron?
this morning. Maybe there's some stuff going on in your life that has kept you from running after God completely. You're feeling yourself out this morning. I want to invite you this morning to say, Lord, forgive me. And today, I put myself aside so that I can have all of you. What is that verse that says, I must decrease so that he can increase? Every one of you in this room was created for a reason by God. And he is seeking you right now. Seeking you to take a step into the more. Would you yield yourself to that today? Would you yield yourself? Maybe this morning you have fear that's been paralyzing you from going after all of God. Because maybe you're afraid that he's going to ask you to give something up. Don't allow fear to have control. But trust God. If God is seeking us out, then He's got a plan. May we say yes. Today the altar is open. If you just need to come and spend some time with the Lord and say, Lord, I'm laying it down, whatever it is, so I can have more of you, I invite you to do that. Maybe this morning there's some unrest in your life and you just need peace. I invite you to come and say, Lord, give me that peace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Jesus, for the kingdom of heaven that is seeking us. We thank you that you are actually out seeking us. You are seeking us more than we could ever seek you. But when we find you, may we be willing to say yes and sell all that we have. Give up all of our plans. Give up all of our fleshly wants and desires to go after you, God. Because, God, I know in my life I've made plans that haven't always been your plans. So, Lord, may we be willing to lay those aside and follow you. Oh, how we love you, Jesus.